Okay, welcome. It's a great pleasure and honor today to, to welcome uh, Philip Sharp. He's part of those who need very little introduction. Uh, I'll just give a, a, a few words. He did his, his PhD in Urbana, then postdoc at Caltech, uh, second postdoc at Cold Spring Harbor with James Watson. And then he moved in, in the 1974 to the MIT, where he's been ever since. He's now at the, the Koch Center for Integrative Cancer Research. Uh, you all know that he got the Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of splicing uh, in '93, And uh, his lab is currently interested in things that we are actually quite interested in as well, which is phase separation and the control of transcription. Uh, but today he will, I think, make a review on the really what is RNA interference, what are the mechanisms, and something he's extremely interested in, uh, what are the applications and how can this technology actually benefit patients and has now invaded the therapeutic field. Uh, we're extremely honored, Phil. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm deeply uh, honored to have this uh, opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm going to talk about a science that became um, apparent in about 2000, RNA interference. And I'm going to talk about how that was translated to the benefit of patients, what that journey was like from a scientific point of view, and uh, set it in the context of the history of this whole field in the sense that uh, I'm going to look back at uh, the discovery of messenger RNA, relate this RNA interference to messenger RNA therapy, and uh, the science that uh, has happened in the intervention. It's remarkable. Over the last two years in COVID, RNA therapy has become a worldwide therapeutic modality. Uh, more change has happened in RNA over the last two years than the last 40 in terms of applications to patients. So um, let's start on a journey. I, I need to make sure you're aware that I'm a co-founder of an ILM, chair of the Scientific Advisory Board, and a member of the Board of Directors. Looking back to the real definition of messenger RNA, uh, I've always considered it the work of Jacobin Minot. Uh, Jacobin Minot defined the pathway between DNA and the expression of proteins with this beautiful work on the lac operon, showing that the RNA was transcribed into messenger RNA, and then the messenger RNA was translated into the peptides that were critical for the metabolism of uh, galactose. And you see an operator at the left of the gene. That operator is a site in which the protein of the repressor binds and controls the on and off switch of the generation of this message. So we see message as an intermediate to proteins, and it's being regulated in the context of the physiology and the environmental, um, environment of the cell. We look at these genes, and the genes themselves are a linear uh, and continuous representation of the genetic code that is decoded by tRNA and ribosomes. And we knew about tRNA and ribosomes by 1961, uh, a time in which I was uh, essentially 17 years old. So you see this diagram defining the field of molecular biology at that time. Well, the world became a little bit more complex as we began to look at genes in multicellular organisms, eukaryotes in general. And we recognize that the gene structure is not that simple continuous sequence of coding for a protein. But in our cells, uh, the gene sequence is interrupted by non-coding sequences called introns. 
And uh, the coding sequences here, represented by these black boxes, which this is a representation of the human genome. The coding sequences are, are joined together by this process of splicing at the RNA level. And that splicing process has multiple uh, opportunities to both include a set of sequences coding for protein or exclude a set of sequences coding for protein. It's just called alternative splicing. So as we will talk about in a moment, we will talk about the human genome sequence. But the, when they determined the sequence in 2001, they looked at our genome and said, oh, this is a gene, and there are about 20,000 of them in our genome. And you shouldn't be too proud of that because the worms crawling around out there in the soil have more genes than you do. So your complexity is not related to the number of genes you have. Your complexity, if you are more complex than that worm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Is uh, a manifestation of this alternative combination of sequences carrying out the expression of different proteins from the same gene. So we're only at the stage now where we can do single cell sequencing and define the nature of a particular protein expressed from a particular gene in a given tissue. So we have, even though we have the human genome sequence, multiple unknowns that are left uh, to be discovered. Well, at the same time in 70, 1977, when the discovery of RNA splicing occurred, there were many other developments, uh, developments that created what I call synthetic biologies. For the first time, we were able to make organisms and genes as organic chemists have been making molecules for uh, centuries before. Recombinant DNA, DNA sequencing, chemical synthesis of DNA all occurred and became apparent in the mid 70s because people were interested as scientists in how to uh, uh, study, manipulate, and understand the function of genes. At this time in the mid 70s, in fact, in specifically 1978, uh, Wally Gilbert at Harvard and myself and a number of European scientists, Charles Weissman, Bernard Locke from Switzerland, Hans Schaller and Peter Hofschneider from Germany, Ken Mary and Brian Hartley from England, started a company called Biogen. Uh, Biogen was the third biotech company organized. Genentech was the first one. Biogen is the oldest freestanding, meaning it is still a freestanding corporation uh, th that is, was formed as a biotech company. It was formed originally in Geneva, Switzerland, but then moved its headquarters to Cambridge, Massachusetts in about 1980 as the first company doing recombinant DNA in the Boston, U.S. area. Now, from 1978, in which that Regent next to MIT was basically an empty lot. Let me uh, illustrate what has happened in that region since. What I show you here is a diagram around MIT. So let's start here. This is the Charles River. MIT affronts the Charles River. And all of these red buildings here are MIT campus buildings. And when we look to the right, particularly in this area, it's Kendall Square, uh, and all these greenish buildings are biotech. There are about 50 significant sized biotech organizations and a number of large pharmaceutical companies who have the research area, uh, headquarters in this uh, complex. And then there's uh, venture capital, uh, energy firms and others illustrated here. But this is the Kendall Square complex in 2018, and the only thing I can say is that the number of green buildings is increasing all the time. But let's look at a few specific uh, companies located in that region. Uh, here is Biogen. It's uh, occupying six 
buildings in this area. That's where its headquarters is at and its major research labs. This is a nylum. I will talk about a nylum in a few moments. Um, here we have Novartis' uh, Biomedical Research Center occupying a uh, large amount of space here with several thousand uh, scientists. Uh, Pfizer is here. Sanofi Genzyme is uh, headquartered in this area and has, is the largest private employer in Massachusetts. And uh, you see here the Broad Institute, which I will talk about in a moment, which is adjacent to MIT and across the street. The Whitehead Institute is right next to it. The Reagan now Immunology Institute is right up the street. So what we've seen in the period over the last <clears throat> 20 or 30 years is a continuous growth of about 10,000 people in one area down uh, from Harvard, which is right up uh, in North Cambridge, across the bridge from uh, Mass General over here, Harvard Medical School, one of the major research and most concentrated biomedical research environments in the world. So let's talk a little bit about Broad. And Broad, as you know, was founded by Eric Lander. It's associated with both Harvard and MIT. And uh, the Broad was a major contributor to the Human Genome Initiative, as were scientists around the world. And that achievement, let's if completing the sequence in 2001, 2003, gave us the sequence of the genome. So we can then talk about how many specific genes, what their structure, what their sequence was, as I've discussed in a moment, with the understanding that alternative splicing makes it a cell-by-cell -cell issue. But this has transformed how we do biology in very important ways, because we can take that sequence and design and study genes and design gene targeting activity basically defined on that sequence. We can understand mutation in disease. We can understand how to intervene in, that, in those disease processes by looking at the genome directly. It has turned biological science into informational science. And what we're seeing in Kendall Square is the appearance of Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and other IT companies. So the future of biomedical research, much of it, is going to be associated with AI, machine learning, and computation. So that transformation is happening, all driven by big data, the ability to accumulate information, based on the genome sequence. Now, part of that has been driven by a decrease in the cost of sequencing. What you see here is from uh, 2001, with the completion of the first sequence, probably two to three billion dollars, all the way down to now. This is taken in uh, 2015. Uh, it was close to uh, uh, $500 at that stage. It's probably $200 now to do a complete human genome sequence in a high throughput environment. So we are going to have the sequence of essentially anyone if they need it for their medical care and understanding their risk in uh, uh, terms of health. So what is that going to tell us? Well, we're now sequencing cancers. We're able to design therapeutics based on certain mutations in those cancer where you have a better response versus toxicity and it's significantly changed how we're treating uh, that disease. But when we look at genetic diseases, <clears throat> we are now uh, becoming aware of the uh, large number of variations in genetic diseases in the population. Now this is taken from about 215 it's a review by a number of gene uh, human geneticists, and uh, the numbers are striking. Uh, in 2015, there were 3,000 Mendelian disease genes known, meaning that these genes cause phenotypes in adults in people as they age, and as well, in many cases, in newborns and uh, 
young adults. 8% of all live births have a genetic disorder by early adulthood. Um, an estimated cost of caring for a child with a genetic disorder they project as $5 million over a lifetime. That includes the loss, I'm sure, of productivity that would be otherwise there if the individual was able to, to work. And the diagnostic rate, strikingly, was only 11% as a child and 34% as an adult. Now, I am sure since 2015, that's 6,000 Mendelian genes, and those diagnostic rates have significantly changed. But here we have a genome sequence where we understand the nature of disease genes, the loss of gene activity, the gain of dominant gene activities that cause uh, medical problems in, uh, in adults, and um, how can we think about new therapeutic modalities that might create a benefit for these patients. And at the same time this happened, the sequencing of the human genome, there was the discovery of this process called RNA interference, which is generated by the synthesis of double-strand RNA from a particular gene sequence. That double-strand RNA in the cell will specify the silencing of the gene. And it uh, depends on a post-transcriptional cleavage of messenger RNA. So between the gene and the protein, it inactivates the messenger RNA. Related processes, which I'll talk about in a moment, as microRNA also regulate genes at translation and RNA degradation. And, trans and related processes in plants and worms actually is their immune system. They create double-strand RNA or use double-strand RNA in those organisms to silence infections and actually transmit that information that they have been infected to the next generation. It's a striking system. But this discovery of double-strand RNA was a product of Andy Farr and Craig Mello in 1998, just as the human genome sequence was being uh, uh, completed. And uh, in 2006, they got a Nobel Prize for this. Andy Farr was my graduate student at MIT. He did this long after that. But as a graduate student, you always are able to claim some special relationship. <laughs> In this case, he sent me the paper. I was uh, uh, deeply involved in running a department of biology. It took me two months to pick up the paper, and when I picked it up, I was absolutely stunned because it suggested that you could make some signal in the cell from the genome sequence that actually would silence a gene. And that intermediate was very important to Determine in with colleagues at MIT, we developed biochemistry. This is David Bartel, Tom Tushel, particularly, and Phil Zamor. And uh, using an extract from, Zena, uh, from Drosophila, we were able to show that that long double strand RNA would be uh, cleaved and processed into what uh, an SI RNA is. Now, this particular structure came from. Tom Tushel's lab as a young investigator in the Max Planck after leaving MIT. And uh, what is shown here is a short interfering RNA. It's an RNA of 19 nucleotides with three prime overhangs. And then you could design this to a specific gene, introduce it into a cell. One of those strands would be taken and the gene would be silenced. Uh, a remarkable, remarkable development because we could chemically synthesize 21 nucleotide RNAs with modifications and all sorts of, of uh, things. So Tushel, uh, in about 2000, showed that if you took and designed an siRNA to the lamin A and C gene and introduced it into HeLa cells, it would silence the expression of that gene. That protein is retained in the nucleus. If 
you have an antibody to a related protein in the nucleus, it, you have no effect. Here's the stain of the nucleus in Herx. Here's the cell with pneuma, and there's the cell in which lamina, lamina is, is silenced. And here is a, another siRNA showing it is specific to this siRNA, and here's buffer control. Striking, striking piece of science showing that a specific RNA designed to a specific gene would silence that gene. And as well, at the same time, it became recognized that a previous observational report by Victor Ambrose and Gary Rovkin in 2003 in worms, where they showed, and I will show you the sequence, uh, a small RNA is silencing the expression of a message uh, controlling the development of the worm, that small RNAs were common of all human cells, Tushel, Bartel, and Ambrose, and Drosophila, that the eukaryotic system had a whole new regulatory process of microRNAs expressed in cells to control the translation stability of a messenger RNA, and every cell in the human body had this pathway, and every cell regulated RNA. And essentially, almost all messenger RNAs are regulated by these microRNAs. So then the microRNA pathway, which had to exist in, in cells, uh, was defined by many investigators where Paul II would transcribe uh, the DNA sequence in the genome, making a precursor that would be processed by Drasha and then Dicer in the cytoplasm, and then joined with Argonaut, Argonaut complex, or called the risk complex. And if this microRNA was exactly complementary, you'd get cleavage of the message. If it was not, you'd get RNA degradation and translational repression. So here was a pathway regulating almost all the genes in your cells with these microRNAs in the cytoplasm that had many of the activities that were common of RNAi and Dicer activity. In fact, the siRNA, when you enter it into cells, and we will talk about that in a moment, enters at this point and is assembled by Argonaut into this system. So a professional RNA presentation and cleavage process. Well, the microRNA pathway, as I mentioned, that controls most of the genes in the cell, depends on uh, a the interactions between a limited set of sequences at the five prime end of the RNA, uh, called the seed sequence, is a comment by a term by David Bartel, and uh, this was originally uh, recognized by uh, the whole microRNA pathway by uh, <coughs> uh, Ambrose and Rovkin. So what is the microRNA pathway? Well, I, you could spend many, many, many. I looked up a couple of years ago. I think there's 5,000 papers published on microRNA over the time since its discovery in about uh, 2000. And this is a, a, a review published in 2000 by Anahan and Weinberg showing pathways that regulate cancer changes in gene expression, proliferation, DNA damage, cell growth, cell death, signaling pathways, and every place you see a red at that stage that was known to be an oncogene, and every one of those pathways are regulated by microRNAs. Development is regulated by microRNAs, cell death, cell stress, almost every process in a cell. So here at 2000, we knew an RNA process that on the basis of gene design could silence a gene. We knew the microRNA pathway was present in all cells, and this was the CRISPR of the day. The same degree of attention that CRISPR got in the recognition of that process was breakthrough of the year in 2002 uh, science, new roles for RNAs. So, given this science, it seemed almost necessary to see if you could design RNA therapies based on this small RNA process. 
And given my experience in biotech and my colleagues at MIT, uh, the company of Anilum was formed in 2002 to gain the resources to actually understand this technology, adapt this technology, and take it to the treatment of patients. And uh, the founders were myself, David Bartel, Tushel Zaymore, and Paul Schimble, a colleague who uh, was at MIT and deeply involved in biotech. He's at the Scripps at that stage. We recruited John Maganori as CEO. I previously knew John as uh, he was a scientist that uh, joined Biogen and developed CureLog at Biogen. And many of the early employees were people that had started their career at Biogen, moved somewhere else, came into Anilum. The company went public in 2004. In 2018, we have approximately 1,000 employees. And in 2021, 22, we have 1,700 with a, a very nice, uh, a, a superb group here in Paris. So this is uh, um, Biogen. I mean, an island, sorry. <laughs> and uh, we had several challenges, and I'll talk about these challenges now. Effective delivery and engineering of features that stability, specificity, and uh, how to deal with the innate immune response and effective uh, RNA at the end of its, its delivery to the ner central nervous system. So the first thing you think about is that if you look at therapeutics, we've been using small RNAs as therapeutics for a century or more. We've developed antibodies that interact with the gene products on the surface of the cell to impinge on the cell growth and viability. And we control proteins that stimulate the cell and signal from the exterior by antibodies. But we can design based on genomic sequence siRNAs that would silence individual genes at the level of message if we can deliver those RNAs into cells. Now, once the RNA is entered into cells, we expect it to enter into the microRNA pathway, be assembled into this organoid complex, take one strand and then pair it to a, a messenger RNA and then cleave it and then be catalytic. So this whole professional process, meaning it is encoded in genes in the cell, is what we were hoping to approach with small RNAs. Now, the first challenge you have is delivery, because RNA itself is a hydrophilic substance. It does not pass through membranes by itself. And therefore, you have to get the RNA from a test tube or a syringe into the body and then into the cell. And the first way you think about doing this is basically say, well, let's treat it like a virus and put it into an envelope. And that was the uh, first process in which lipid nanoparticles were developed that have specific properties and uh, glycocarbohydrates uh, on their surface to allow them to, to be, uh, 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 to, to have a half-life in the bloodstream. They bind to uh, a protein, the one that was developed by Anilum, APOE. Uh, that signals uh, its binding to hepatocytes. Uh, the liver is a target because the fenestration allows a lot of blood flow through the liver. It's internalized. And once it's internalized into an endosome, there is acidification. And these lipids have a particular charge structure that at pH 5, they change their conformation, become bilayer type, and it is believed that that is what releases the siRNA into the cytoplasm, and that's then assembled into this risk complex. So the conformational change of the, of the lipids seem to be uh, major uh, determinants of the efficiency, and knowing that and designing a number of the lipids you see that you get your most efficient delivery at a P5 
pK of about 6.2. These are all different carbohydrate, I mean lipids with different charge structures. And therefore, optimizing this and other characteristics, the delivery was increased on the order of three orders of magnitude to enhance the uh, effectiveness of the siRNA and to reduce the, uh, the uh, uh, amount of RNA one has to deliver. These same particles, this same chemistry is now being used for delivery, not the identical chemistry, but a, a related chemistry of your messenger RNA in the RNA vaccines. Now, the first test of this technology was in uh, the treatment of genetic TTR, transurethin, uh, where the protein accumulates in neur motor neurons and in uh, heart tissue to cause uh, a pathology. It's frequently, uh, is typically fatal after a five to 10 year progression. It's a, a genetically transmitted condition. There is a wild type condition that you see onset in late uh, cardiopathy, but uh, with a known uh, target uh, causing this in a dominant fashion, uh, you could think about silencing it in the, in the uh, liver tissue. And this is the delivery of siRNA to TTR. We're measuring here the knockdown of TTR in the bloodstream. You see it's about 80%. Uh, it's over uh, two years. This is a placebo and you're treating regularly through this period every every month or so with an uh, IV infusion. And uh, this was the first siRNA treatment that was approved uh, for uh, treatment of patients and it's under the name of Onpetro. And uh, the uh, uh, progress of patients on this, which I won't discuss in any detail, is this is a, uh, a walk uh, assay at a uh, number of months, nine months, 18 months. These are patients who were not treated with placebo, and these are patients that were treated, and there's improvement in the uh, uh, activity of the patient and the well being of the patient, whereas the placebo progressed. So, the first therapeutic in introduction of siRNA was through this lipid nanoparticle presentation and was effective in impacting on these patients and they're benefiting now worldwide on this treatment. But this required IV in, in delivery and uh, a more convenient and more therapeutically available delivery would be to have a sub-Q injection and to not deal with this lipid nanoparticle as a complex entity. So in meeting that challenge, uh, Anilum and its scientists uh, took the, the challenge of introducing the siRNA through a linkage to one strand to a galnac lipid. And that gal, not lipid, sorry, carbohydrate. And that we surmised, would target the acyloglycoprotein receptor on the surface of a hepatocyte, would be internalized because this process pulls glycoproteins out of the blood in about a 15 minute cycle. It would pull the siRNA into the endosome. The, it would escape at a low efficiency, enter the risk, and direct cleavage of messenger RNA. And that then allowed us to deliver, or allowed Anonym to deliver by a sub-Q injection. And to stabilize the RNA, because it was going to be exposed to blood and uh, associated factors in the bloodstream, the RNA was modified at specific sites in specific ways to retain activity, reduce its innate stimulation of the innate immune response, which is stimulate interference and others, uh, and to uh, increase the stability and activity of the, of the RNA. 
And by uh, that process, you were able to extend uh, over longer periods of time the activity of the siRNA after injection sub Q. So this process then was discovered, was developed, and over uh, a period of uh, development steps, uh, the uh, efficiency of silencing uh, continued to, this is uh, percent of baseline, uh, increase as we, uh, at lower and lower levels of the siRNA introduced. So we made it, it was made by anonymous scientists into a more effective siRNA delivery system in patients. And the interesting thing as we began, as they began to modify and stabilize the RNA in the bloodstream, is that the stability of the effect of silencing uh, increased dramatically. So this is in patients, and uh, this is one injection of a siRNA for PCSK9. This is now approved for treatment of patients. Uh, it is being uh, developed, it, commercial clinical trials was done by the genetics company. Novartis is, is marketing it. And what you see is one injection at 300 milligrams gives you silencing of that PCSK9 over six months. So one injection per six months, you have specific silencing of a gene in the liver of the patient. It titrates reproducibly, and this is a placebo, and this is a uh, complement five protein with the same type of, of biological response. So now you can chemically modify in a way that uh, has uh, been shown in patients to be safe and effective in silencing a specific gene in the liver of a patient. Now, as I commented on, if you um, look at the stimulation of cytokine production directly by the RNA being introduced into cells, you can get a very significant stimulation out of non-modified RNAs, even with GALNAC, but chemically modified reduces the stimulation of many of the known cytokines through innate immune response. And this had to be dealt with before you could actually think about treating patients because these create uh, many symptoms in patients, including lethargy. Uh, uh, and the second thing, sorry. And another issue that had to be dealt with is all these RNAs, as I have made the point, when introduced into cells, are entering the argonaut complex and therefore could be used in the same way as microRNAs to partially pair with sequences in messenger RNA and to control their expression. And this would be considered an off-target effect of the siRNA into cells. And to actually get a very clean activity, you needed to design around the activity of the, S, the microRNA pathway uh, by modifying nucleotides with a specific uh, uh, backbone chemistry that is described in publications that uh, destabilized this interaction but doesn't impact on the complete pairing and cleavage of the RNA. And through that, you were able to then, and what is shown here, is silencing a specific gene in embryonic stem cells. This is the target, and you see you're silencing over uh, about tenfold. And uh, what you see here, this is RNAs shifting significantly in expression. These RNAs are being targeted through the microRNA pathway. This is the siRNA pathway. And by appropriate modifications, you can basically eliminate 
the microRNA pathway and get a, a very effective, retaining almost complete activity in the siRNA pathway. So over a period of time, using chemistry and delivery technology, increase the efficiency of delivery of siRNA through the design of linkers and ligands by essentially three orders of magnitude, making this a therapy that is appropriate for patients. And now there are three approved applications of this technology to treat patients. The last one was a PCSK9 approved by the FDA in December of 2021. So here we have a genome designed siRNA system, oligonucleotide system, that can be directed to specific genes. We know a lot about controlling specificity. We know a lot about controlling the, the uh, activity of off-target pathways. And we're getting effective silencing of a gene. Not complete silencing, but effective silencing. Something that could offer a new therapeutic modality that could be used to treat many, many dise possible diseases. But the most exciting possibility to me is the possibility that we will be able to use this technology to treat diseases or problems in the central nervous system. There is not an area of healthcare that is as limited, in my opinion, as therapeutic uh, treatment of problems in the central nervous system. And among those is Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and frontal temporal dementia, Huntington's and others. And uh, we really uh, do not have effective therapies for those. So this is beginning to be explored by a number of uh, organizations. But uh, we're very excited, and I'll only mention that we find siRNA, this has been published, uh, that uh, can be injected in the lumbaric region. Uh, and this is in uh, rat, but also we have data in primate, non-human primate, that the siRNA will, and this is silencing SOD1 in uh, tissue after injection, about 48 hours uh, in different regions of the brain. And you see in the lumbar region, it's about 80 to 90% effective. In the thoracic, it's about the same. In the cervical, it's a little less. In the cerebellum, it's about 70%. In the frontal cortex, it's a little less. In the remaining brain. So we think that we will be able to get siRNA. This is single dose. siRNA silencing and specific silencing in the CNS. Now that's a think. And there's a long drink of water between think and, and do. But it's a very exciting possibility. And this, again, just shows that uh, in a uh, non-human primate, you see silencing through uh, different strata uh, regions of the brain. And you also see silencing in the eye. So you can inject siRNAs into the eye and see specific silencing, uh, as shown to the right there, of TTR in the eye. Now, the, the exciting, another exciting feature here is, it's not totally clear, but it seems likely that the longevity of siRNA silencing in these tissues will be similar to what we see in the literature. It could mean one injection per six months to one year. So it becomes then a very interesting uh, way of controlling the expression of genes in these tissues. So as I've shown you before, over decades, we've seen increased enhanced 
stability, template modification, increased stability, increased specificity, and targeting. And we have, uh, Nylum has five approved therapeutics, uh, acute ATTR in peripheral neuropathy, acute hepatic porphyria, the liver target, uh, primary, uh, uh, primary hydroxyurate, uh, oxalate control, cholesterol, and uh, uh, a uh, uh, siRNA uh, amyldosis uh, TTR in the peripheral neuropathy. So early days, but from 2002 to 2022, 20 years of development, the resources it took to do this is $3 billion. So we were able to translate and create, we as a nylum, I'm just on the board, advise it, 1,700 people. Been able to take this technology and create a new therapeutic modality that I think has enormous promise to the benefit of patients. So I want to Thank my colleagues at MIT, particularly David Bartel, Tom Tushel, and Phil Zamor, and the leadership and employees at Anilum from 2002 to 2022, who have been instrumental in making this happen. But as a scientist, to see a fundamental discovery translated into treatment of patients in 20 years is just one of the highlights of your career. There's just no other way to describe it. I love fundamental science. <laughs> you know, I've spent my total career understanding how genes work in mammalian cells. That's what I wake up in the morning and think about. It's what I wake up in the evening and think about. But to take, when you have a breakthrough in science and to take it as quickly as you can to benefit a patient, which takes 20 years, took Biogen 20 years, is a, a remarkable gratification. And I thank you for the opportunity to discuss it.